Let me throw some figures your way. Let's say 6,000 or 7,000 or perhaps 8,324. Or let's say 20 and then throw after that a percentage, perhaps 50%. And what about them, these figures? They tell us something about that faculty that brings individuals together to form groups, groups that form communities, communities that form people, form us. For their figures that tell us something about language and languages. They tell us something about the number of languages spoken in the world. And yes, there is a degree of uncertainty, the ors and perhapses, because we don't know for sure how many languages we have in our world. No more than we can be sure about how many species of birds and flowers, of trees and animals we share with our planet. Or well, the big players are easy to quantify. They can be more readily seen and heard. And we're pretty sure that half the population of the world, that's the 50% mentioned, speaks about 20 of all the living languages. We know that there are some 1,412 languages recognised by national constitutions, laws and so on. But the endangered languages, it's those that are more difficult to count. And that's where the figures vary by a thousand and more, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 plus. And then there are the categories of danger, vulnerable, definitely endangered, critical, extinct. These languages, the endangered ones, are just like those other living things, such as the golden plover, a cutiad air, or the marsh fragrant orchid, te gerian peregors, a bird and a flower, both found just about in Wales, as it happens, and both threatened by a death that would be an extinction. But hold on, we can't simply juxtapose rare languages with rare species. After all, a people whose language dies is not a people without language. That their language has died does not render them dead, nor mute for that matter. Their language has died, but they live on, speaking now another. And surely that makes life easier for all of us. All difficult differences ironed out. Communication, dim problem, no sweat. Well, let's just stop and think. The myriad different birds, flowers, insects, plants, animals, fish, give us a diversity that we are finally beginning to relearn how to look at it and see it. And relearn to understand how life on our planet needs that diversity, depends on it. It's probably time to relearn how to look at the diversity of languages. And so as we think about UNESCO's Decade of Indigenous Languages that starts this year, 2022, why don't we take the opportunity not so much to look and see, but to listen and hear? What happens when we listen to the linguistic landscape of the world? What would we hear if we, in Wales, were to listen to, let's say, Avar, Mundari, Angikan, Kekchi, names of languages I found either side of Welsh on one of the many lists of threatened world languages. Avar, a language heard in Eastern Europe, Mundari, spoken by the Munda in India, Angika or Chika Chiki, spoken again in India and in Nepal, Kekchi, spoken in Guatemala and Belize. Or what about just popping next door to Ireland and to Irish, or next door but one to Canada and to, let's say, Wullas Tuguay? Just six out of 8,000 plus. Listening to languages such as these and more 
we would hear voices, different voices that carry words, different words that carry meanings, different meanings that carry ways of understanding, different ways of understanding that bring with them old wisdoms and new possibilities. The kind of differences that can be easily exemplified by remembering that in Welsh we can't say we have anything. It's always a case of there's something with us. And there it is, a different way of constructing the relationship between us and the things around us. And that's just one example from two languages we already know. Listening. What might we hear, even in individual words? Recently, by listening to a new acquaintance, Tarira Chenika, I heard new words, five to be precise, from Shona, that enabled me to learn something new about love. Rudo, she said, is love. Rvakadzika, love that is deep. Ravaka Reba, love that is long. Ravaka Naka, love that is beautiful. Ruzinga Tsanan Goriki, love that is indescribable. And again, quite recently, by listening through a website to recordings from endangered languages, I heard words that enabled me to learn something new about life in the environment. Iecho from the Muisk Kobun language in central Colombia, meaning the good path, the good living. Kaipawarmi from Quechua in the Ayacucho Peruvian Andes, meaning the internal strength of women. And Itro Filmongan from Mapudungun in Lake Budi, Mapucha, Chile, one word for the tangible and intangible elements of the diversity of life. Then listening to to listen in Welsh, I hear the word gurando. I listen gurandawaf. And if we peel back the layers in this verb, we find in it the root tau, dau, gurandawaf. And that tells us that the original meaning of to listen in Welsh is to be quiet, be still. So let's be still, be quiet, with our ears wide open, ready to catch the sounds of words that will help us see, if seeing is understanding, see what I mean, or catch the words that will help us hear, for hearing too is understanding, think French, j'entends, I hear, j'entends, I understand. And since we got to hear, hear, not hear, let's remember the Welsh for to hear, cloed, and think about how in Welsh we can hear smells, cloed aragl, hear taste, cloed blas, hear touch, cloed ivreiche am danav, and hear sounds, cloed seniai. One verb working hard to convey at least four of the five senses. Five senses! Well, whose language is that? Are there languages that offer us more? Many remind us that if there are five outer senses, then there are at least three inner ones. Understanding, imagination, memory. Those faculties that, like language, enables us to experience life beyond the here and now. As such, language, therefore, like the senses, tends to be the vehicle that enables us to express and also to perceive, I would argue, the things around us. Well, this year, let's take time to perceive language itself. Notice it, and not just our own. Notice, listen really hard to hear beyond the languages we usually listen to. For the ever-presence of our own language can sometimes make us deaf, blind, numb to the languages of others. Of course, those spoken in faraway places, 
but also even when some of them live on the same street as us. How about taking time to think about how language enables us to hear, but also contrastingly can make us deaf to differences? especially when that language is a dominant language and a language that is so powerful, so confident in itself that the sound of it can blast out all the sounds of all the other languages without us even noticing how. And as we listen, let's see how language has more than the four key skills that we've been led to believe it has beyond listening with languages, speaking them, reading them and writing them, let's notice how we mediate with them. If most of the people in the world live in bi and multilingual communities, then most of us are using one language to bridge to another. Translating, interpreting, dialoguing, peacemaking. Well, let's hope so. And while we're at it, let's abandon that lurking understanding that listening is somehow the passive twin in a pair where speaking is the active sibling. What will we hear? Who knows? Easy sounds, music, harmony, difficult sounds, dissonance, complicated sounds, uncomfortable sounds of questions with hitherto absent answers hierarchies we hadn't heard before and things we didn't know we didn't know because we hadn't stopped to listen to them well perhaps so let's open up be still and listen to a world that is a landscape of languages <laughs>